all right so philosophy sports is a new uh, do I want to? Yeah, is, is, is basically it's a new model for cafe philosophy. I've done a lot of cafe philosophy, uh, but basic, but it ran aground. There were problems with it. And I have in the years since uh, I stopped that, I, um, I still continue a bit, but I developed a new idea and I call it philosophy sports. So it is a response to the problems that develop in cafe philosophy. Um, so, and it's basically a way to sort of exploit the idea of virtues, especially as they exist in sort of sporting contexts, uh, like fair play is a primary one. They can function in a way to in reintroduce a kind of objectivity or objective standards and a shared concern for truth. So the idea was basically, you know, it's trying to reform people gathering together, participating. I call cafe philosophy, by the way, public participatory philosophy. So the participatory part is something I take seriously. How do you make a bunch of people who don't know philosophy do philosophy? That's the problem that I'm talking about. I don't think you have to know philosophy to do philosophy, but you have to have some way of doing it and philosophy sports is one. Not one, it's a, it's a one way of doing it, but there are many philosophy sports that are possible. It's a broader conception. I'll give you an example of one that I've developed. So the idea is to use the internet, the internet connected devices to bring people together in various gamified forms of social reasoning. And the reasoning isn't really, as you'll see, to reach a conclusion, but it, to, it really exposes the, the assumptions. Uh, so I'm going to be demoing here for the first time ever, a, uh, a new educational software. What it is not is a decision-making software for a group to come to a decision. It looks like that, <laughs> but it's not that. Um, and it's not a pretext to defer to consensus. It looks like it's a, it is census seeking and so, census, sorry, consensus seeking in some sense, but it also reveals die census. And that is just as important. Um, so I started Cafe Philosophy in 1997. That's what it looked like. Um, in Victoria, uh, in, um, and it continued for 12 years. I did over 540 sessions, was uh, for a sort of a long time there, vibrant community, but uh, problems developed. So this is the very first sessions, uh, the very, very early sessions that we had when we started. This is another view of that. And uh, I can just, I was just looking over here, seeing some regulars, people who came for many years, this was in the first year. So uh, I, in, in this cafe, there was on the bulletin board, uh, a, a, te a, a London Telegraph article uh, about, um, this is in Chinatown in Victoria, BC, Canada. Um, I had a philosophy shop just a couple of blocks down. I used to come here and get my coffee every day. But one day that they, they directed me to the bulletin board and said, look at this. And it was a, an article about Mark Sauté. He just started uh, four or five years earlier, the, uh, Cafe Philo. And I had already had this idea. I, I was going to do it, but I didn't do a damn thing about it until I heard it. They challenged me to do it and I started. Eventually, I ended up four different places. This was the last one at Solstice Cafe. Fabulous. These are, I can see all these regulars here. There's a doctor, a nurse, a, psychi a psychologist, uh, and I can't quite make out some of the other people here. These are the regular people. They're everyday people, not philosophers, but, but they came. The problems that developed over time, and especially at the end, were serious, however. I call the big one the pedestal problem. Basically, the cafe situation, this is Mark Sauté style. I didn't quite do what he did, but Mark Sauté style cafe philosophy has these problems. That is basically, you're passing the microphone around. Everybody gets a chance to stand up and hear themselves speak and see themselves being seen. And they like it, they like to do that. So, and, and they're very polite, these Canadians, and they all do it. However, the level of interaction with people responding to what each other said, that did happen over time. Some people tried to do it, but it wasn't really, um, the, the overall flavor was one of hospitality, how to welcome people in. And as a, as a result, there was no critical interaction. Um, there was really just a, a, a series of opinions. That's what I mean by the pedestal problems. But it's worse than that, because actually to extract an opinion from people is not that easy. 
people will talk about usually somehow way maybe kind of well for me it's that way and stuff like it's very difficult to actually get people to take a stand on things and say look no no this is true don't you people see you have to agree to this and like to get some kind of uh disagreement going to try to resolve it in some way so there's little logical coherence people who visited notice how it went everywhere and it was really it reminds me a lot of everyday mind everyday mind it's not it's not single pointed it's not one pointed it's many pointed oh here's a new thing here's a new thing let me look at that there was no discipline to take to, to take one thought and connect it to another and if you don't have any logical connection at all you have no sense of argument and you don't need a notion of truth, of establishing truth. And so I think the problem was that the forms of feedback were that we were all welcoming and hugging each other. And when there was an apre, par, apre cafe that people went to and they celebrated and drank and everything. So that's what it was like. Here I am outside this, this cafe. Uh, it was a great place, but we were there for several years. But the problems developed. And eventually, I, some years afterwards, I developed a kind of a critique of it based on Anthony Simon Layden's book, uh, Reasoning, a Social Picture. And I really recommend this book. It's a wonderful book. Um, he's a political philosopher uh, and, um, and he talks about reasoning as a conversation instead of as like a deduction or a proof, the way I learned it in, in, in high school, what we do in most critical thinking classes, so, and what I did, I'm not going to go over these. <laughs> these are all the aims and values or desiderata that I came up with that I thought would be very good if we could do that in a cafe setting, we'd really be doing philosophy because we aren't doing philosophy with the pedestal problem and the other ones. So I came up with these and this was published in a book edited by Lydia Mir and, and Alexander Fatik. It's uh, from called Practicing Philosophy. You can find out about it. Um, but then uh, based on a few years later, talking with some other cafe philosophy facilitators around here, there's a big program where I live now in, in Vancouver, Simon Fraser University's Philosophy Cafe, Simon Fraser University's Philosopher's Cafe. It's been 24 years or something like that. It seems to be suspended right now for the pandemic, but um, uh, it's been going on for a long time and I participated a little bit in it here. But with some of those people, I came up with the idea of philosophy sports. Now, it, which here's the definition. So live, it's live, it's facilitated, it's in a cafe or a classroom, it's internet mediated, everyone's got their phones, and they're games of competitive persuasion, but there's a lot of collaboration involved in which players attempt to convince others of the truth of some main claim, a controversial claim, by entering into their phones distinct revisable reasons to play reasons in play that will be uh, and then are they're subjected to everybody's scrutiny and focus and uh, vote basically uh, and although everybody's trying to gather as much support for the views that they put forward uh, you only win by changing your mind you only win by changing your mind it's not a debate it looks like a debate it's not a debate and so in order to because it was expensive to develop the internet version of it i i instead developed a, a a board game version so i have a board game version of it here which i've used in class and people use little uh device little uh like plastic animals and so on like this uh, and they staked out their positions if you believe the main claim was true you put it on one side the other side but the blue and the red represent the premises and the premises are the reasons in play that are put in the center there and and then they're gathered in the yellow areas like this. So, all right, now to continue. The paper that I just mentioned and several others, including some by Lydia Amir, have come are, are coming out this year in a book that I edited called Cafe Conversations. It's available for pre-order now. I think it's the first in English that it involves theoretical discussion of what's going on at Cafe Philosophy. Um, also, I have another book uh, uh, coming out this year in April this year, which is available also for pre-order. I hope people will look at it. It's How to Play Philosophy. These are essays I wrote for Cafe Philosophy participants. I wrote them in advance. We didn't discuss them like we, you did at a seminar or something, but they just they were provocative and funny and they were attempts to get people thinking about subjects to say, hey, there's a whole history of ideas from many traditions that, so that we can, you can rely on in discussing these. And you can check out my websites there. I think I put some of that information in the chat. 
and just one other thing I'm doing, I'm translating books by Gerd Achenbach. Uh, so uh, that was what my other talk was about. So I hope people will look at that. That was, uh, that's it for that. Now, um, let me just, uh, how do I get out of that thing? I don't want that. Uh, all right. So, and this is also very quickly is my website. These are those books I just mentioned. And down here on the right here, you can see there's a table of contents. You can see there's a lot of people. I, I translated uh, Marc Sauté uh, from French for this book. Uh, and uh, we've got Walter Cohen. There's a lot of great people here, fabulous essays in these books. Uh, um, the last part, the conceptual underpinnings, I, I, I hope people look at it. It's, it's the first one. There may be some in other languages I don't know about. And then up here, these are like blurbs to support my book, How, How to Play Philosophy, the essays. Uh, that's what the cover will, will look like. And you can get those at various places uh, there. So now we come, this is my philosophy sports website. But, uh, and you will be able to get the app that I'm going to describe here. And you can actually will be able to download the board game, the board itself, if you want to go through the printing. But what I want to do for the, for the remainder is to demo this game to give you some idea of what it's like. It's actually one particular game. The game is called, the, the, the game is called Tug of Logic, the board game, and it's been developed into an app. So I just want to take you through what it's, it's kind of like uh, uh, to play it. Um, hot off the presses, I'll tell you. So the first thing you'd look at is it, here you, to create a game. So this is the role of, I call the logic referee uh, who kind of runs the game, okay? So you press this and you get, uh, just one second, I have to get a certain file here. Uh, it's here it is, so oh, there it is right there. And let's just suppose, that, so what the, this is the main claim. So this is what you need is a controversial claim, something that's gonna divide the room. Some people honestly have one opinion, some people have a different opinion. If everybody agrees about something, there's no game to play. So you just put that in there, something like this, and we're gonna choose one, say from Thrasymachus and Plato, uh, how justice is the interest of the strongest party, controversial claim. And you just click start the game. Now I've actually already started it, so I'm not going to actually start it. I'm going to just go here. And this is what it looks like when you start it here. Uh, and so there's the main claim. And for the first part, just focus on this top bar. This is the important part in the phase one. There are four phases. The first phase is an initial poll. So uh, now the next thing that we need is you have to join the game. So if I've got this right, no, that's not right. Just a minute, one second. I have to grab this game here, this, this number and put it in here and this uh and then this is uh going to be thrasimachus that's going to be the name of this character and this is what his looked like now i'm just going to transfer this over here so now what we have uh is uh, thrasimachus you see his name is right here just look at the top bar thrasimachus but i've actually already set up four different players brainy betty the second one is Conformist Clark. They're automatic names that are generated by the software and Bright Virtue. So there are four players in this game. And what they see is this, and they are able to vote on this. Now, this is not proper color. You can't quite see it, but this says either convinced or not yet persuaded. So we don't use the words true or false, but people vote, every player votes. So it's, first of all, we're looking at Thrasymachus. You can see his name there. And of course he supports this idea. So he says, support it. Uh, he supports it. And now this bar has turned blue. Let's suppose here conformist Clark, maybe he's got like Nazi sympathies or something. So, so he sort of supports it too. But the others, this is Brainy Betty, she's not persuaded of this idea. And you can see the bar there registers it. And neither is Bright Virtue. That's, that's the name that they came up with. Not yet persuaded. Okay, so now we've got an even split. Two people think that things true. And Two people think that it's not true, okay? So at that point, the, the, go back, going back over here, the referee can say, okay, we've got a game, we've got a divided thing. So let's get started. And uh, then, the, okay, let me just go through this. Uh, let me see, I gotta make sure, create players. Uh, uh, now, all uh, uh, the fourth phase, I just want to anticipate the end. The end is going to be the fourth phase, and it's going to be a final poll. It's going to look just like this at the end. So the real, the, the beginning, the book ends here, the beginning and the end, as people put out an initial, they stake a position at first, and then there's a long discussion. 
And at the a facilitated discussion, just like at a cafe or in a classroom, facil, uh, a series of, of facilitated discussions uh, in between. And then at the end, there's the final poll. And the final poll looks at whether people have changed their mind. Okay, so after they've made this vote, you can't actually change their vote, but at the end, the final poll, you come back to it and everybody gets a chance to say, has the intervening discussion made any difference at all to what I think? All right, so let's suppose we go ahead with that and or we start that. And now what I, what I would do is I would close this straw poll because everybody's voted as the logic referee over here now. And, uh, and then I would, um, uh, we enter the second phase, which I call the say why phase. And that's where everybody gets to a chance to put in their answers, their, their reasons for or against. So we've got four players here and they have four. I'm going to go to Thrasymachus right now. And everybody can put in their reasons right here. Now, uh, they can be for or against, and they'll all show up in this list and the, and the, logic referee can decide what, uh, which ones to choose. But let's just go with, for right now, let's put Thrasymachus says, first of all, the strongest party is able to, uh, is the party that's able to make laws. Okay. And now anybody could be submitting, but let, let's let Thrasymachus make, make his own full argument, okay? So the next one he says is, those who make laws do so in their best interest. And you can see they're visible over here for the referee, and actually all the players can see them too. Uh, and this signifies that they can be edited. So Thrasymachus is able to edit and change the wording of his phrase, and so can the referee. And he needs one more premise. We can't get to a conclusion about justice unless we have a premise about justice. So I put in that, and now we've got the three premise are justice is obedience to the law. The law is in the interest of those who make the law and the strongest party are the ones who make the law. So the, the, the justice is in the interest of the strongest party. You put them all together, you can sign to see that. Now I've put them all together here. Thrasymachus has this full argument. In the classroom setting, in a cafe setting, People often give one reason and you have to go after them to find their missing premise. They don't really think of the missing premise because it's implicit, it's hidden. So now the idea is they have to, they have to unbury that hidden premise because they can't get to a conclusion about justice without a premise about justice. They can't get a, to a conclusion about interest unless they have a premise about interest. They can't get a conclusion about the strongest party unless they have a premise about it. So they've got all the premise here. It's really up to the logic referee to make sure that the arguments are complete. So here now we finished phase two. Normally there were all these players might have reasons for or against. They would all stack up here and the referee would be able to choose. But let's suppose that uh, th this is done, we now are going to enter into phase three. Phase three is, uh, and that is where here, I uh, will start with the first one and I press, I could pick any one of these as a logic referees, but I'm gonna fix this one. And look, everything changes. Now, the focus is this statement here, the first premise. And each player is able to vote on that premise. So there's two stage voting for the conclusion already, but the, each premise has to be voted on. And, the, and Thrasymachus, we go back to Thrasymachus here, he, of course, he will say established, but he's gonna vote for all his premises, of course, but the others may not. And Thrasymachus is not able to get to the final stage poll unless he can convince everybody of all of the premises. See, so the, um, now how does that look? So let's suppose here's Thrasymachus, he says, oh yeah, this is what I mean by strongest. You wanna know what I mean by strongest? It's this. Okay, so, and that's what happens. There's a, this is the live social feedback that happens. The second, uh, or I'm gonna go jump to the third player. They look at this, and this is Brainy Betty. And she says, the strongest party? I don't know, maybe, maybe strong means something else. I don't think so. So she doesn't agree. And then, but this uh, conformist Clark, he says, well, he, he's just defining his terms. Let him define his terms. So uh, I think that's true. And, and maybe the fourth one says that too as well, okay? So we have three people agreeing and one person disagreeing. 
This is where there's a, a, a bout of facilitated dialogue. I call it a bout of logical scrimmage. And this is the scrimmage score right here. So this can change. Any player at any time can change their vote on the premise. They can't change their vote on the main claim anymore, but they can change their, their on the vote as the vote is being discussed. And so I can, as a facilitator, as a logic referee, you can go, you, how did you vote on this one? And what did you think? Why did you vote that? And, and you can ask people and you can have this discussion. And so uh, let's suppose that after some discussion, everybody says, okay, okay, not everybody agrees, but the logic referee says, well, okay, this is enough. We've had, this is just a definitional premise. Let's go. So what happens is then this bout is ended because it has sufficient support. Because it has more than 50%, it's up to the logic referee to what the, what the threshold is. But let, let's suppose that, that this one is, is, they've discussed it enough, they say most people agree with this. So then it's moved to the established ground. It's elevated to the established ground. The referee clicks this. And now everyone sees, it's updated, we've got one premise that's established. And it's trying to prove the main claim up here. So now we have these other two bouts and we can begin a second bout. Now the second bout has those who says those who make the laws do so in their own best interest. Now what's going to happen as I for illustration purposes is each of the bouts are going to have a slightly different dynamic, okay? So now we start discussing this a facilitated, facilitated discussion of this. Um, and let's okay, we go first to Thrasymachus, of course he accepts he, notice the terms of the vote here. He doesn't say it's true or false. He says it's established. It's obvious. If you don't think it's established, uh, and that maybe, um, uh, but look, well, actually, thinking about this, if people make laws in their own interest. People do everything in their own interest, don't they? So maybe everybody will say, yeah, 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 of course, that's obvious. People are always uh, looking out for number one, of course, except maybe one person, bright virtue, says, well, you know, I'm not sure there's something, there's something funny about this. I'm not sure there's a big discussion about it. And, and, and um, so it's on the verge of being established like the last one. But then one of the players says, well, hold it here. Do we mean that everybody, these people who pass the laws, that they work for what's actually in their best interest or what they think is in their best interest, in their perceived best interest, which is now everybody says, oh, perceived interest, that's different, that's different. And suddenly everybody says, oh no, this is wrong. This is, this, this, no, they don't act for their own best. They don't even know what their best interest is. Now everybody's on the side of bright virtue who said, look, the, the player named bright virtue, who says, who, who brought this up. And now it falls back to Thrasymachus. What's Thrasymachus going to do? Thrasymachus can edit this. Thrasymachus can change this in order to get more support. So suppose he says, yeah, okay, okay, okay. That's not what I want. I'll just have the referee do the editing. I just, uh, I edit, click here. I said, that's not quite what I meant is those, they do it in their own perceived best interest. That's what's that's what I mean. So those of you who know play those dialogue is this is the beginning of a contradiction that that uh, that Thrasymachus will be found in by Socrates. But now he says now now the wording has changed. Everybody gets the updated wording. Now everybody votes again. Well that's obvious. Sure. Everybody's working for their perceived interest. And even Bright Virtue says yes, yes, of course. There's a complete agreement so we can move it to the established ground. And now we have a two premise argument. Now we come to this last, last premise here and we start that one. And of course, Thrasymachus says, it's obvious. And people say, justice, obedience to the law? This is where, is that, that seems strange. That's a little weird. So maybe nobody accepts this or, oh, I don't know. Let's just say that, uh, conformist Clark said, okay, okay, that's his kind of conformist thing. Uh, but, uh, but others don't, okay. So at this point, it's, it's split. There's no support for this. This is not established. This premise is not established. And so Thrasymachus cannot proceed to the final stage, the fourth stage, the final poll to see if Thrasymachus has been able to convince anybody there. Okay, so, but, so normally I would not press this established ground because it's it's not established it's all it's it's disputed it's contested 
But uh, just for uh, illustration purpose, I'm going to do that. And now we've got the complete argument there. And what we do now, I'm, why don't we, I take you back up to the top pole here, and now we go to the final pole. So now this has been established or not quite in our game, but now we start a final pole and everyone is back in the same position, the same claim, they get to choose this. Now, so let's say Thrasymachus is convinced, but let's say that conformist Clark who agreed with it earlier has been thinking, you know, like that premise too really changed things for me. So they don't accept someone brainy Betty she originally didn't accept, but now for whatever reason, suppose she does, just for illustration purposes, let's suppose she accepts. But back here, bright virtue, no way she's not explained. So the overall result is the same. That's, I've only got four players, so it's kind of gonna, but if you got 20 players or something like that, it, it's very unlikely to be different. So, so even though that's the same overall result, that's an accident. What's happened is that some people have changed their mind. And so, the last thing after people have a short time to make their to register their last their vote, the logic referee is the last act can press this the logic winners and what happens is there's a list of all the players who change their vote from the first vote from from not yet persuaded to convinced or convinced and not yet persuaded remember those are the terms for the initial poll they're not established or contested those are different words. So this at this point, as with the presentation, like, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm wrapping it up right now. I mean, this is the end of it. So at this point, what the facilitator, the logic referee can do is go, Brainy Betty, what changed your mind? Conformist Clark, how did you change your mind? What was it? So there's a kind of an interview process. Maybe in the game, there can be a token prize or something. But you see that it's the people who change their mind that the focus is on in the end. All right, so I hope people are interested. They're probably totally shocked and surprised at this, but um, let me just say thank you very much. And here's the game again, and I'll end my screen share. Thank you.